To imagine a more appropriate choice to deliver a lecture named for the late Edward Said than Noam Chomsky. The careers of both men combine the most meticulous scholarship and political passion and personal courage. Both have stood as the conscience of an intellectual world that far too often succumbs to the temptations of power, of the powerful. Like Saeed, Chomsky is not, a, not afraid to say the unpopular thing, to point out that many emperors have no clothes, to project alternatives when the media and, the, and political leaders say that no other course is possible, um, and to think of what may be rather than what is. This is why for students, scholars, and political activists around the world, uh, both Saeed and Chomsky have served as a source of inf inspiration. There's a story that in the 1970s, uh, the Prime Minister of Italy gathered a group of intellectuals and pleaded with them to help solve one of that country's periodic crises. I think it was Umberto Eco who rose and responded, Mr. Prime Minister, the role of intellectuals is not to solve crises, it is to create crises. <laughs> Let us hope that Noam Chomsky continues to create crises for those in power for many years to come. So ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome the Edward Said lecturer, Noam Chomsky. When I was a young teenager and uh, my father was getting a little nervous about some of the directions I was pursuing. He did mention to me that he had been a member of the IWW and I was sort of curious so I, I asked him why he joined the IWW and he said uh, when he came over on steerage as an immigrant and I was working in a sweatshop in uh, Baltimore, barely knew any English, uh, he said uh, a guy came around and was trying to sign people up. He couldn't understand what he was saying, but he seemed to be for the workers, so he signed up. <laughs> I don't think they have that in Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, well, to the subject. Uh, I think that the greatest singular achievement of Said as a literary critic has been to put imperialism at the center of Western civilization. And what you find in both historical, political literature and literary works in the West in the last 400 years is a great emphasis on the role of enlightenment in the making of civilization and its discourse. You find a great deal of emphasis on rationalism, on democracy, on democratic <coughs> values, and on liberalism as an aspect of enlightenment. Uh, there's an almost remarkable tendency to not mention imperialism as shaping the contours of Western civilization in literary criticism and historical writing. There are two times before Said's Orientalism and after Orientalism. Well, I've been quoting the assessment of uh, Edward Said's literary contributions by his close friend and comrade in struggle uh, Ekbal Ahmed, he was like, like Edward, he was a rare and uh, stellar example of an engaged intellectual uh, dedicated to truth and justice in word and in action. Their passing a few <coughs> years ago is an irreparable loss for the poor and the suffering of the world and also for depth and clarity of thought and understanding. Uh, among uh, Edward's many achievements was to draw the culture of imperialism uh, out of the shadows and explore its deep roots and its pervasive implications uh, in many domains. And in these remarks I'd like to uh, explore some of uh, its specific manifestations, uh, focusing on the events that uh, opened the way to the famous unipolar moment of unchallenged U.S. global hegemony 20 years ago. I was interested to see the pictures on the wall as I came in, re remembering those moments, uh, and also the ways in which these events are remembered on the 20th anniversary, uh, which was celebrated last month. Uh, to do so requires following two tracks. Uh, one is policy, the other is its interpretation through the prism of 
imperial ideology. Uh, and the dawn of the unipolar moment is a very instructive test case, I think, in both domains. Uh, we can gain a, a sense of how deep are the roots of imperial ideology by considering completely unambiguous cases. Uh, none are more clear than horrendous crimes that are, were frankly acknowledged by the perpetrators, but passed over as insignificant or even denied in retrospect by the beneficiaries, namely us. Uh, settler colonialism, which is commonly the most vicious form of imperial conquest, uh, provides quite graphic illustrations. The English colonists in North America uh, had no doubts about what they were doing. Uh, revolutionary war hero uh, General Henry Knox, the first Secretary of War in the newly liberated uh, American colonies, uh, he described, I'm quoting, the utter extirpation of all the Indians in most populous parts of the Union by means more destructive to the Indian natives than the conduct of the conquerors of Mexico and Peru, uh, which would have been no small feat. Uh, in his later years, uh, after his own contributions to these crimes were long past, uh, John Quincy Adams lamented the fate of uh, what he called that hapless race of Native Americans, which we are exterminating with such mer mer uh, merciless and perfidious cruelty among the heinous sins of this nation, for which I believe God will one day bring it to judgment. Uh, there were some who offered a more comforting refrain among them Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story, who wondered at the mysterious ways of providence, which in its wisdom caused the natives to disappear like the withered leaves of autumn, even though the colonists had constantly respected them. Uh, distinguished contemporary commentators reinterpret the wisdom of providence in secular terms. Uh, one example is the prominent Yale historian John Lewis Gaddis, the sort of dean of Cold War historians, uh, he uh, hails Adams, John Quincy Adams, as the grand strategist who laid the foundations for the Bush Doctrine. Uh, the doctrine that, as Gaddis puts it, expansion is the path to security. It was a very convenient doctrine for those who can get away with it or have powerful patrons. Uh, with evident appreciation, Gaddis observes that the doctrine has routinely applied throughout the history of uh, the infant empire, as George Washington termed the New Republic. He passes in silence over Adams's gory contributions to the heinous sins of this nation as he established the doctrine in a famous state paper justifying the conquest of Florida on utterly fraudulent pretexts of self-defense. Uh, the conquest was part of Adams's project of removing or eliminating Native Americans from the Southeast. It's uh, William Earl Weeks, the leading historian of the massacre, who provides a lurid account of what he calls this exhibition of murder and plunder, uh, targeting lawless Indians and runaway slaves. Gaddis cites Weeks, but spares us the content of what he said. Uh, uh, to mention an even more extreme example, uh, just a few months ago in the New York Review of Books, uh, political analyst Russell Baker describes what he learned from the work of uh, uh, the heroic historian, as he calls him, Edwin Edmund Morgan. Uh, namely, here's what he learned, that Columbus found a continental vastness sparsely populated <coughs> by farming and hunting people in the limitless and unspoiled world stretching from tropical jungle to the frozen north there may have been scarcely more than a million inhabitants I looked carefully no letters appeared in reaction though uh, a few months later the editors did publish what they called a clarification which stated that in North America recent re research suggests that the numbers may have been as high as 18 million. Well, the clarification is perhaps even more telling than the original. Uh, Baker, first of all, was not referring to North America, uh, rather from 
tropical jungle to the frozen north. Uh, the research is not recent, it's decades old. And it was also known a long time ago that the sparsely populated, unspoiled world included advanced civilizations, in, also in what's now the United States. Uh, nevertheless, the exercise of genocide denial with a vengeance uh, merits little concern or comment, uh, presumably because it's so unremarkable and in a good cause. Now, not all cases of genocide denial get such an easy pass, and the criterion is not very difficult to discern. Uh, the European Union recently approved what they called a framework decision on com combating racism and xenophobia, uh, which bans publicly condoning, denying, or grossly trivializing crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Uh, putting aside the question of whether the uh, holy state should be granted the right to determine historical truth and punish a deviation from its edicts, uh, what's of particular interest here is the selectivity of concerns. Now, there was a, a, a response among historians who were upset about it. They feared that the framework decision might bar not only questions about the Holocaust, which is already banned in many countries, but also inquiry into crimes of the Ottoman Empire and Stalinist Russia. Uh, well, perhaps other cases come to mind, uh, perhaps with Western powers as perpetrators and beneficiaries, but that question didn't arise. Uh, to this day, uh, the United States is reverentially admired, at home at least, as a city on a hill, or as Ronald Reagan, Reagan preferred, a, a shining city on a hill. Uh, last April, <laughs> Uh, British historian Jeffrey Hodgson was admonished by New York Times columnist Roger Cohen for describing the United States as just one great but imperfect country among others. Uh, Hodgson's error, Cohen explained in the New York Times, is his failure to realize that unlike all other states, past and present, America was born as an idea as a city on a hill, an inspirational notion that resides deep in the American psyche. So its crimes are only unfortunate lapses that do not tarnish the essential nobility of America's transcendent purpose. I'm borrowing the phrase of the eminent scholar Hans Morgenthau, uh, one of the founders of the hard-headed uh, realist school of international relations expounding on what he called the purpose of America. The uh, inspirational phrase, city on a hill, was coined by John Winthrop in 1630, uh, outlining, outlining the glorious future of a new nation ordained by God. Uh, one year earlier, his Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, had received its charter from the King of England, and it established its uh, great seal. Uh, the seal is worth looking at. I think it ought to be on the wall of every classroom in the country. It depicts an Indian uh, with a scroll coming from his mouth, pleading, come over and help us. Uh, the charter states that rescuing the population from their bitter pagan fate is the principal end of this plantation. So the English colonists were guided by what Obama's UN ambassador, uh, Susan Rice, calls the emerging international norm that recognizes the responsibility to protect innocent civilians. Uh, the colonists were thus on a humane mission uh, as they extirpated and exterminated the natives for their own good, as their successors <laughs> explained. So President Theodore Roosevelt uh, orated that the expansion of the peoples of white or European blood during the last four centuries has been fraught with lasting benefit to most of the peoples already dwelling in the lands over which the expansion took place, uh, despite what Africans or Native Americans or Filipinos or 
other beneficiaries might mistakenly believe. Uh, this venerable conception, which is still very much alive and in fact operative, it's been guided in part by the providentialism that has so deeply influenced American culture from the early settlers up to George W. Bush. In his case, there's some pretty remarkable examples. Uh, this is the conception that we're carrying out uh, God's will in his mysterious ways. Uh, that's, and that's been accompanied by another thesis, also venerable, also very much alive, the thesis of Anglo-Saxon superiority, uh, which traces back to the original Aryans and the Teutons in the German forests, uh, who maintained their racial purity by exterminating those in their paths. Uh, they then crossed the channel, did their work, and then came over here, which is why we're a city on the hill. Uh, these beliefs are deeply ingrained in English cultural history, and they carried over to the infant empire established by the English in those uh, limitless and unspoiled world that they found. Uh, for the founder of American anthropology, Lewis Morgan, the Aryan family represents the central stream of progress because it produced the highest type of mankind and because it has proved its intrinsic superiority by gradually assuming control of the earth. Uh, Charles Darwin endorsed the view that the history of the culture of mind from Greece to the Roman Empire and onward only appears to have purpose and value when viewed in connection with or rather as subsidiary to the great stream of Anglo-Saxon emigration to the West and finally to the United States where the advance of civilization has reached its peak because the nation produced the greatest number of highly intellectual, energetic, brave, patriotic, and benevolent men. Uh, as the uh, project was approaching its final stages, final success in the mid-19th century, uh, the government, governor of California, Peter Burnett, informed the public that the war of extermination will continue to be waged between the two races until the Indian race becomes extinct. The inevitable destiny of the white race is beyond the power of, uh, is beyond the power uh, and wisdom of man to overt, uh, to uh, uh, avert. Only the Lord understands it. Uh, the progressive national poet, Walt Whitman, uh, saw the course of history in a similar way. Our conquests, he declared, take off the shackles that prevent men the even chance of being happy and good. Uh, on the conquest of half of Mexico, uh, he asked uh, rhetorically, what has miserable, inefficient Mexico to do with the great mission of peopling the new world with a noble race? Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote that it's very certain that the strong British race, which has now overrun much of this continent, uh, must also overrun Texas and Mexico and Oregon also, and it will be in the course of ages of small import uh, by what particular occasions and methods uh, it was done. Uh, it's easy to go on, but examples are really quite unfair because the ideas have been conventional. In fact, they're almost universal. It's hard to find exceptions. Uh, the, uh, there's some. And approaching the present, uh, very few eyebrows were raised, as far as I could see, when a leading scholarly history of U.S. diplomacy, this is 1969, uh, commented wittily that uh, after liberating themselves from British rule, the United Colonies were able to concentrate on the task of felling trees and Indians and of rounding out their national borders. It's liberal scholar Thomas Bailey, one of the standard histories of American diplomacy. Well, it's important to recognize that after the uh, civilizing effect of the activism of the 60s, uh, such words are no longer acceptable, although there's a long way to go. Well, with these uh, inadequate words of background, let's turn to the present on the double track of policy and ideology, uh, beginning with the latter, with ideology. So let's begin with the month of November 2009. Uh, that was marked by... Uh, the joyous 20th anniversary celebration uh, 
of what British historian Timothy Ar Ar Garden Ash calls the bi biggest year in world history since 1945, which changed everything, thanks primarily to Mikhail Gorbachev's reforms within Russia and his breathtaking renunciation of the use of force, a luminous example of the importance of the individual in history, uh, leading to the fairly open uh, Russian elections of March 1989 and culminating in the fall of the Berlin Wall on November 9th, uh, which opened the way to liberation of Eastern Europe from Russian tyranny. Uh, that's what's celebrated on the pictures as you walk in. Uh, the general mood was captured rather well by a British barrister, Matthew Ryder, uh, writing in the London Observer. Uh, he spoke for uh, uh, what he called the Niners. Uh, that's the generation that's now providing global leadership, Barack Obama in their lead, and their conception of history was shaped by a world changed without guns in 1989, uh, events that gave them confidence in the power of dedication to nonviolence and justice. That's today's global leaders. Uh, these uh, accolades for November 9th are deserved, and the events are indeed memorable. And the picture is even compelling, which is why it's virtually 100% of commentary, as you can check for yourselves. It's compelling as long as we keep rigorously to a dominant principle of imperial culture. We must focus laser-like on the crimes of enemies and our, on our own uh, high-minded condemnation of the crimes of enemies. But crucially, we must make sure never to look at ourselves. And the principles apply in the familiar way to the events of last November. And some alternative perspectives uh, mostly unintended, uh, may be instructive. Uh, so, uh, one was provided unintentionally by German Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel, uh, who called on all of us, quoting her, to use this invaluable gift of freedom to overcome the walls of our time. Uh, that's good advice, and we can easily follow it. Uh, one way to follow it would be to uh, dismantle the massive wall, which dwarfs the Berlin Wall in scale and in length, uh, which is snaking its way uh, through Palestinian territory. In <laughs> of course, in gross violation of international law, if anyone cares about such details. Well, like virtually every state action, this annexation wall, as it should be called, uh, is justified in terms of security. That's a reflex, whatever a state does. Uh, but as is commonly the case, the claim lacks any credibility at all. Uh, if security were the concern, the wall would be built along the border, and it could be made completely impregnable. Uh, the purpose of this illegal monstrosity, uh, which uh, is constructed with decisive uh, U.S. support and European complicity, is to allow Israel to take over valuable Palestinian land and the main water resources of the region. Uh, that's one part of a much broader annexation project which we fund and support, otherwise it couldn't continue. Uh, the highest Israeli authorities uh, recognized from the outset that these programs were in direct violation of international law. There was never any ambiguity. It's leading legal authorities in Israel. Uh, but uh, as Defense Minister Moshe Dayan commented, and this is late 1967, settling Israelis in occupied territories contravenes, as is known, international conventions. But there's nothing essentially new in that, which is quite true. Uh, so the issue can be dismissed. At least it can be dismissed as long as the global hegemon uh, provides uh, diplomatic cover and the needed material and ideological support and is therefore a co-partner in crime. Uh, another perspective on the 2009 celebrations 
is provided by the leading scholar advocate of uh, what's called democracy promotions, Thomas Carruthers good scholar who writes from an insider's perspective. Uh, he served in these programs uh, during the Reagan administration and regards himself as a kind of neo-Reaganite. Uh, after reviewing the record, uh, Carruthers ruefully concludes that all U.S. leaders have been schizophrenic. They need some kind of psychiatric help. The schizophrenia is uh, that they support democracy if and only if it conforms to strategic and economic objectives by some strange accident. Hence, they support it in Soviet satellites, but not in U.S. client states. Uh, these judgments were dramatically verified through the 1980s period leading up to the fall of the wall. Uh, the fall of the wall has been rightly celebrated in recent weeks, but there's been little notice of what happened one week later on November 16th, 1989. It's in El Salvador. That was the brutal assassination of six prominent Latin American intellectuals, a Jesuit priest, along with their housekeeper, Julia Elba, and her daughter, Celine, by the elite uh, Atlacatl battalion, armed and trained by Washington. Uh, the battalion had just returned from a several month refresher course at the JFK Special Warfare School at Fort Bragg. And a few days before the murder, uh, the battalion took part in a further training exercise run by U.S. Special Forces uh, flown to El Salvador. Uh, the battalion is heralded as El Salvador's best. Uh, the battalion had already left a bloody trail of the usual victims uh, during the horrendous decade of the 1980s which opened in El Salvador with the assassination of Archbishop Oscar Romero, the voice for the voiceless, as he was called, by much the same hands. And the story was similar throughout Central America, leaving hundreds of thousands of corpses and general misery uh, during a reign of torture, murder, and destruction, uh, guided by the Reagan administration under the guise of the war on terror that they declared in 1981 as they came into office. Well, it was surmised at the time that the murder of the Jesuit intellectuals was planned by the high command of the Salvadoran army. And that was confirmed two weeks ago uh, by the publication in the Spanish press of uh, the document, the actual document, ordering the murders uh, and uh, the murder of any witnesses. Uh, this was signed by the chief of staff and his associates. It's all in hand. Uh, all of them so closely connected to the Pentagon and the embassy, U.S. Embassy, that it's very hard to imagine that Washington was unaware. Uh, these dramatic discoveries have yet to be reported here, and I am not anticipating that they will. Mainstream Spanish press, wire services, takes some competence to miss them. Uh, one can easily understand why the consciousness of the Niners was shaped, to non shaped by dedication to nonviolence and the power of idealism. Now, that's fair enough if attention is rigorously guided by the culture of imperialism, is focused on their crimes, uh, with ours removed from sight and removed from memory. Now, the contrast through the 1980s between the liberation of Soviet satellites and the violent crushing of hope in U.S. domains is striking and instructive, but it becomes even more so when we broaden the perspective. The assassination of the Jesuit intellectuals uh, was a crushing blow to liberation theology. That was the remarkable revival of Christianity that had its modern roots in the initiatives of Pope John XXIII and Vatican II, uh, which he opened uh, in 1962. It's an event that uh, ushered in a new era in the history of the Catholic Church, I'm quoting the distinguished theologian Hans Kuhn. Uh, inspired by Vatican II, uh, Latin American bishops adopted what they called the preferential option for the poor, uh, renewing the radical pacifism of the Gospels that had been put to rest 
when the Emperor Constantine in the fourth century uh, uh, established Christianity uh, as the religion of the Roman Empire. As Kung describes it, that instituted a revolution which converted the persecuted church to a persecuting church as it has remained. Uh, in the post-Vatican II attempt to revive the Christianity of the pre-Roman period, uh, priests, uh, nuns, uh, lay persons, took the message of the Gospels uh, to the poor and the persecuted, uh, brought them together in base communities, uh, encouraged them to take their fate into their own hands and to work together to try to overcome the misery of survival uh, in the vicious realms of U.S. power. Well, the reaction to this grave heresy was not long in coming. In 1964, a military coup uh, took place in Brazil. The basis was laid for it by the Kennedy administration, actually occurred a couple of weeks after his assassination. Uh, it established a national security state in Brazil, kind of a neo-Nazi national security state. It overthrew a mildly social democratic government, instituted a, a, a reign of torture and violence. It was the most decisive victory for freedom in the mid-20th century, according to Kennedy Johnson Ambassador Lincoln Gordon, uh, who added that uh, the democratic forces now in charge should create a greatly improved climate for private investment. Uh, Gordon's words were echoed uh, just a few days ago uh, when Obama's ambassador to Honduras called the elections under the military regime a great celebration of democracy, while the State Department informed the press that the issue is not uh, who is going to be the next president. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Honduran people decided that, uh, having exercised their choice between two supporters of the military coup that ousted the elected president. Uh, as often in the past, uh, the U.S. separated itself from almost all of Latin America, and in this case, even from Europe, uh, in this brazen act of contempt for democracy and human rights. In the wake of the Brazilian coup of 1964, a monstrous plague of repression spread through the hemisphere. It included the, what's in Latin America is called the first 9-11, namely in Chile in 1973, which by any objective measure was far more severe than what we call 9-11. It included the uh, killers and the torturers of, uh, in Argentina, who were Reagan's favorites. It finally reached Central America uh, through the 1980s. Uh, in the course of the uh, terror and slaughter, the practitioners of liberation theology were a prime target, among them the martyrs of the church, uh, whose execution 20 years ago is now commemorated with a resounding silence, barely broken. Uh, forgotten almost completely are Julia Elba and Selena. Uh, the one survivor of the massacre, Father Jan Sobrino, uh, reminds us that uh, they are the symbols of the suffering masses of El Salvador and indeed of the world. Uh, there's been much debate about who deserves the credit for the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was also the topic of a recent meeting uh, in Berlin of the three presidents most directly involved. Uh, Germany's Helmut Kohl concluded the meeting by saying, I know now how heaven helped us. Uh, George H.W. Bush uh, generously praised the East German people who for too long had been deprived of their God-given rights. Uh, Gorbachev suggested that the U.S. needs its own perestroika. Uh, there are no such doubts about the uh, demolition of the attempt to revive the Church of the Gospels. The School of the Americas, now renamed, uh, which is famous for its training of Latin American killers, uh, proudly announces as one of its talking points that liberation theology was defeated with the assistance of the U.S. Army, uh, given a helping hand, to be sure, by the Vatican, 
uh, using the gentler means of uh, expulsion and suppression. Uh, the bitter campaign to reverse the, set, the uh, heresy that was uh, set in motion by Vatican II, uh, that has received uh, incomparable literary expression in Dostoevsky's Parable of the Grand Inquisitor. In this tale, as I'm sure you know, set in Seville uh, at the, I'll quote it, in the most terrible time of the Inquisition, uh, Jesus Christ suddenly appeared on the streets, uh, softly, unobserved, and yet strange to say everyone recognized him and was irresistibly drawn to him. Uh, the Grand Inquisitor, recognizing the grave danger, uh, bids the guards take him and lead him away to prison, where the old man accuses Christ of coming to hinder us in our great work of destroying the subversive ideas of freedom and community. Uh, we have taken the sword of Caesar and follow him, not thee, the inquisitor admonished Jesus. Uh, we seek to be the rulers of the earth uh, so that we can teach the weak and vile multitude that they will only become free when they renounce their freedom to us and submit to us. Uh, then they will be timid and frightened and happy. So tomorrow I must burn thee and put an end to thy evil ways. Uh, but finally the old man relented and let him out into the dark alleys of the town. The prisoner went away. Uh, notice that the pupils of Port, Fort Bragg learned a rather harsher lesson. Uh, in 1977, the highly respected Jesuit priest, uh, Rutilio Grande, uh, preached in El Salvador of his fears that very soon the Bible and the Gospels will not be allowed within our country. We'll get the covers and nothing more because all of its pa pages are subversive. And I fear, my brothers, that if Jesus of Nazareth returned, they would arrest him. They would take him to the courts and accuse him of being unconst uh, unconstitutional and subversive. Uh, his insight into policy was all too accurate a few Weeks later, he was assassinated, again by the same hands, first of the series of assassinations in Central America of Jesuit priests. Well, these two events, the collapse of Russian tyranny and the destruction of the evil ways of the Gospels, were linked symbolically when the hero of 1989, Václav Havel, came to Washington shortly after the assassination of his Salvadoran counterparts. Uh, he spoke before a joint session of Congress, and he received thunderous applause when he praised the United States as the defenders of freedom. Uh, the intellectual classes were entranced. At the extreme dissident end, uh, Anthony Lewis uh, hailed Havel for teaching us that we live in a romantic age. Uh, the Washington Post described Havel's message as a voice of conscience that speaks compellingly of the responsibilities that large and small powers owe each other. And under, others wondered why American intellectuals do not ascend to these lofty heights. Well, one can imagine the reaction if the circumstances had been reversed. And it's a thought experiment that uh, is useful to carry out, could teach us a lot about ourselves. Well, let's turn to the second track, policy. Uh, how did policymakers react to the fall of the wall, uh, initiating the unipolar moment? A few, a few weeks later, uh, the United States invaded Panama. Uh, the purpose was to kidnap a minor thug who was brought to Florida and uh, sentenced for crimes that he committed, for the most part, while on the CIA payroll. Uh, he had switched from valued friend to evil demon by dragging his feet on supporting Reagan's terrorist wars in Nicaragua. Uh, the, there were official pretexts, but they were so thin that they were refuted instantly. I won't in insult your intelligence by going through it. Uh, the invasion killed several thousand poor people, according to Panamanian human rights investigators. Uh, there are no official U.S. sources. Uh, we don't do body counts, as General 
Tommy Franks, the conqueror of Iraq, explained. Uh, the invasion uh, re, uh, re, uh, reinstated the rule of U.S. banked, uh, uh, US -backed bankers and narco-traffickers. In fact, narco-trafficking went way up. Uh, it's commemorated by a day of mourning uh, in Panama. It was hardly more than a footnote to history, but it did have some new features. Uh, one of them was explained by uh, uh, former State Department official Elliot Abrams, uh, returned since. Uh, he pointed out that uh, this was the first time the United States had been able to intervene without concern for a Russian reaction somewhere in the world. And uh, other prominent commentators uh, elaborated. They pointed out that with the Soviet deterrent gone, the U.S. would be free to resort, resort uh, more readily to force violence and subversion to achieve its global aims. Uh, another novelty was that the invasion of Panama it could not appeal reflexively to the communist threat. It's a couple of weeks after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, so a new pretext was needed, and it was quickly supplied. It was the threat of Hispanic narco-traffickers uh, seeking to destroy the United States. Uh, the drug war had, in fact, been declared by Richard Nixon for interesting reasons that I have to put aside. But it took on a new, uh, a new role as the unipolar uh, moment dawned. And uh, similar considerations guided the general formulation of policy after the collapse of the uh, monolithic and ruthless conspiracy aiming for world conquest, borrowing John F. Kennedy's phrase. Uh, within months, uh, after the fall of the wall. Uh, Washington outlined its new course. Uh, in brief, everything will stay very much the same, but with new pretexts. So we still need a huge military system, uh, but for a new reason. The technological sophistication of third world powers. Nobody laughed. Uh, <laughs> called, you know, the independence of the intelligentsia. Uh, we still have to maintain what they call the defense industrial base. That's a euphemism for high-tech industry. We're not allowed to concede that we're very far from a free market economy. Uh, the high-tech economy relies very heavily on uh, the dynamic state sector, much of it under Pentagon cover. Uh, we must maintain intervention forces uh, directed at the Middle East energy regions where the, I'm quoting, where the significant threats to our interests could not be laid at the Kremlin's door. That's contrary to decades of deceit. Uh, no apology. Uh, all of this and much more like it was passed over quietly, uh, barely even reported. Uh, but for those who hope to understand something of the world, it's pretty instructive. Uh, as a pretext for inter uh, intervention, the war on drugs was far too narrow. A more sweeping mission was needed, and the intellectual community quickly turned to the task. Uh, they declared what was called a normative revolution that granted the U.S. the right of humanitarian intervention as it chose uh, for the noblest of reasons, but that's by definition. Uh, the traditional victims were unimpressed, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, conferences of leaders of the Global South uh, immediately and bitterly condemned what they called the so-called the so-called right of humanitarian intervention. Uh, their stand was upheld by a high-level UN panel in 2004, in this case with leading U.S. figures participating, uh, among them former National Security Advisor uh, Brent Scowcroft and the distinguished Australian diplomat uh, Gareth Evans. Uh, a refinement was therefore necessary. And again, the intellectual classes rose to the occasion, uh, devising a new doctrine, uh, responsibility to protect. It's familiarly known as R2P. It's now the topic of a substantial literature, many conferences, uh, new organizations, uh, academic journals, and much praise. And the praise is in fact justified, at least in one respect. Uh, we may recall uh, Gandhi's response 
to the question of what he thought about Western civilization. He's alleged to have said that it would be a good idea. Uh, and the same holds of R2P. It would be a good idea. Uh, on that, I think everyone should agree. But then the usual problems arise. Just what is R2P and when does it apply? Well, on the first question, what is R2P, there are two versions which are commonly, in fact, systematically conflated in the West, but they're quite different. Uh, one was given formal expression at the United Nations World Summit in 2005, and a radically different position is articulated in the founding document of R2P, that's the report of an international commission in 2001, of which the leading figure and spokesperson is Gareth Evans. Uh, the World Summit, UN World Summit, it basically reiterated positions already adopted and in fact implemented by the United Nations, at most with a sharper focus. The summit, in particular, adopted the persistent, unchanging stand of the World Court, the Global South, uh, the high-level UN panel, uh, namely the stand that forceful action can only be carried out under Security Council authorization, uh, with an exception that's irrelevant, uh, although it did grant the African Union a qualified right of intervention within the African Union itself. Now, if that exception were generalized, the consequences would be intriguing. Uh, for example, Latin American countries would be authorized to carry out large-scale terror in the United States <coughs> to protect victims of uh, U.S. violence in the hemisphere. Well, the conclusion is immediate, but never drawn for some odd reason. Uh, in any event, we can put the African Union exception aside, although it is commonly adduced by proponents of R2P to try to show that it's, an inst it's not an instrument of imperialism, but rather is rooted in the South, as it is in the World Summit version of R2P. And well, that, that's one version. The second version of R2P in the Evans Report differs fundamentally from the summit declaration. In its crucial paragraph, the commission authorizes action within area of jurisdiction by regional or sub-regional organizations subject to their seeking subsequent authority from, from the Security Council. Now, this is 2001, and the paragraph was plainly crafted to apply retrospectively to the bombing of Serbia. Uh, just what was forcefully rejected by the Global South, the high-level panel, and the World Summit version of R2P. Uh, this provision of the Evans Commission effectively authorizes the powerful to use force at will. And the reason is quite clear. Uh, the powerful unilaterally determine their own area of jurisdiction. Uh, the Organization of American States and the African Union, they can't do that. But NATO can and does. Uh, NATO determined that its area of jurisdiction includes the Balkans, but interestingly, not NATO itself, uh, where shocking crimes were committed against Kurds in southeastern Turkey uh, right through the 1990s. It's all off the agenda because of the decisive military support for them by the leader of the free world, Bill Clinton. Uh, NATO later determined that its uh, uh, jurisdiction uh, uh, extends to Afghanistan, as you know, uh, and also uh, beyond. Uh, officially, it now extends to protection of pipelines, sea routes, and other crucial infrastructure of energy systems on which the West relies. Now, these expansive rights granted by the Evans Commission uh, are in practice restricted to NATO alone, uh, radically violating the principles of the World Summit. And they explicitly open the door for resort to R2P as a weapon of imperial intervention at will. Well, let's turn to the second question. How is R2P applied in practice? Uh, the answer will surprise no one who has the slightest familiarity with history or elementary understanding of the structure of power. I'm not going to run through the highly selective 
application. It's exactly as you'd expect. Uh, but just take a few examples. Uh, there's no thought of devoting pennies uh, to protect the huge numbers of people dying from hunger and lack of health care. That's at a level far beyond, far higher than Rwanda, probably twice the Rwanda level among children alone, uh, and not for a hundred days, but every day and increasing. Uh, uh, victims who are uh, protected populations by law, protected populations are also barred from protection. Among them, the victims of the U.S.-Israeli attack in Gaza early this year. Uh, they are protected persons under the uh, Geneva Conventions, but they're not part of the responsibility to protect. Uh, victims who are the direct responsibility of the Security Council also are unable to appeal to R2P. The most striking case is Iraqis uh, subjected to Clinton's murderous sanctions, uh, which were condemned as genocidal by the administrators of the UN programs, the respected international diplomats, Dennis Halliday and Hans von Sponek, uh, who successively resigned in protest against these violations of the Genocide Convention. So they're not protected. Uh, also not protected are the victims of uh, the worst massacres of recent years in the Eastern Congo, uh, and only the cynical might suspect that the neglect has something to do with the fact that the worst offender is U.S. ally Rwanda, and that multinationals are making a mint from robbing the region's rich mineral resources uh, with the crucial aid of the militias that are tearing the place to shreds. Anyone who has a cell phone is a beneficiary. Uh, and on and on, exactly as the rational would suspect. Well, returning to the dawn of the unipolar moment after the fall of the wall, uh, another question that came to the fore right away was the fate of NATO. Now, its traditional justification had been defense against the Russian hordes. So with the USSR gone, pretext evaporated. Uh, naive souls uh, who had faith in prevailing doctrine and believed what they were taught in school uh, would have expected NATO to disappear as well. Uh, quite the contrary. Uh, NATO quickly was expanded uh, to the east in violation of pledges to Gorbachev. And as I just mentioned, it's since been expanded well beyond uh, to a global intervention force under U.S. command. Uh, one mo motive, very likely, we don't have internal documents, but very likely that one, inter one motive is to prevent Europe from pursuing an independent course, and perhaps along Gaullist lines. Now, that's been a primary concern of U.S. planners since World War II. Uh, more generally, policies during the unipolar moment and up to the present have kept very closely to the guidelines that were devised by uh, FDR's planners during World War II. Uh, they recognized uh, that the United States would emerge as the dominant global power displacing Britain, and accordingly they developed plans for the United States to exercise control over a substantial portion of the globe. This uh, grand area, as they called it, was to comprise, at a minimum, uh, the Western Hemisphere, the former British Empire, and the Far East. And in the grand area, quoting them now, the U.S. would hold unquestioned power and would act to ensure the limitation of any exercise of sovereignty by states that might interfere with its military and economic supremacy. That's Roosevelt. Uh, note the similarity to the Bush Doctrine that uh, outraged articulate opinion uh, 60 years later. And review of the intervening period reveals that the same doctrines prevailed, uh, and in fact still do. Uh, a good illustration is uh, Bush's immediate predecessor, Bill Clinton. He's regarded as a centrist moderate, pretty much Obama's model. Uh, under Clinton, the U.S. officially reserved the right to act unilaterally when necessary, including unilateral use of military power to ensure uninhibited access to key markets, energy supplies, and strategic resources. Uh, that's without even the pretexts of 
self-defense uh, on which the Bush neocons insisted. Uh, the Clinton doctrine elicited no condemnation or maybe even comment, unlike the arrogant and contemptuous proclamations of the Bush administration, and rightly, because it just reiterated long-standing uh, positions and it was uh, presented with polite restraint. Uh, uh, in the early days of World War II, uh, Roosevelt's planners thought that Germany might prevail in Europe, but as Russia ground down the Wehrmacht, uh, the vision became more expansive. Uh, the grand area was to incorporate as much of Eurasia as possible, at least Western Europe, economic, its economic heartland. Uh, detailed plans were developed. Uh, for world order, and they were soon implemented right after the war. Uh, each region was assigned what was called its function in the U.S. dominated global system. So, for example, Southeast Asia was to fulfill its major function as a source of raw materials for Japan and Western Europe under the U.S. aegis. Uh, the South in general was assigned a service role. Uh, it, uh, it was to provide resources, uh, cheap labor, uh, markets, investment opportunities, uh, more recently other services uh, such as export of pollution and waste. Uh, that's what's happening in Somalia right now. Uh, at the time, uh, the U.S. was not much interested in Africa. So Africa was handed over to Europe to exploit, it's the word that was used, for its reconstruction from wartime destruction. That happens to be George Kennan's phrase. Uh, one can imagine different relations between Europe and Africa in the light of history, but these were not considered. Uh, they violate the imperial culture. Uh, in contrast to Africa, uh, Middle East oil reserves uh, were recognized to be a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the greatest material prizes in world history. It was the most strategically important area in the world, in Eisenhower's words. Uh, control of Middle East oil would provide the United States with substantial control of the world, uh, top democratic planners recognized, and those principles remain in force. Uh, with regard to Latin America, post-war planners concluded that the primary threat to U.S. interests is posed by radical and nationalistic regimes that appeal to the masses of the population and seek to satisfy the popular demand for immediate improvement in the low living standards of the masses and development for domestic needs. And these tendencies conflict with the requirement of a political and economic climate conducive to private investment with adequate repatriation of profits and protection of our raw materials, ours. So. God happened to place them somewhere else. <laughs> Mysteries of providentialism. Uh, and a large, uh, later on, uh, it wasn't just radical and nationalist regimes, but also this uh, heresy of the effort to revive Christianity, pre-Roman Christianity. And a large part of uh, subsequent history uh, flows from these conceptions. A support for harsh dictatorships proceeds unchanged. Uh, as President Obama uh, set off to deliver his highly praised Cairo speech, uh, he hastened to explain that he did not regard Egyptian uh, President uh, Hosni Mubarak as an authoritarian leader. In his words, I tend not to use labels for folks. Uh, when a political leader uses the word folks, you know you're going to shudder at what comes next. Uh, Obama obliged. He praised Egypt's brutal dictator as a force for stability and good in the Middle East. Uh, just as in the past, support for democracy and for human rights uh, keeps to the pattern that scholarship has repeatedly discovered, standard schizophrenia, uh, correlating very closely with strategic and economic objectives. Uh, it's small wonder that outside the West, very few take U.S. charges against Iran very seriously, and not only the alleged concerns for human rights, uh, which doesn't reach the laugh meter, uh, but also the primary charges uh, that Iran is concealing something from the International Atomic Energy Agency, as it doubtless is. 
Uh, others are concealing nothing at all. Uh, for example, the three countries that have never signed the non-proliferation treaty, uh, India, Pakistan, and Israel, uh, all of which have relied on the United States, on US support for their nuclear weapons programs. Uh, at the peak of the recent furor about Iran, uh, India announced uh, that, quoting, it can now build nuclear weapons with the same destructive power as those in the arsenals of the world's major uh, nuclear powers, which means Pakistan will try weakly to match it. Uh, at the same time, the International Atomic Energy Agency passed a resolution calling on Israel to join the Non-Proliferation Treaty and to open up its nuclear facilities to inspection. Well, the US and Europe tried to block the resolution, and when they failed, they voted against it. It passed anyway, and President Obama hastened to assure Israel that the US would support its rejection of the resolution. Now, the White House also assured its Indian ally that it can ignore Security Council resolutions on nuclear weapons, uh, crucially the most recent one, uh, Resolution 1887, on September 24th. Uh, that resolution, you may recall, was hailed as a great victory for Obama and his conflict with Iran. But if you bother to read it, it's short, you can find it on the internet. It said nothing about Iran. It was directed against the United States, Israel, and India. Uh, Obama reacted to Resolution 1887, uh, not only by telling India that they can ignore it, but also in a different way. Uh, two days after he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his inspiring commitment to peace, uh, the <laughs> Pentagon uh, announced that it was accelerating delivery of the most lethal weapons in the arsenal, as short of nuclear weapons. These are 13-ton, kiloton bombs uh, to be delivered by uh, B-52 stealth bombers. Uh, they're designed to destroy deeply hidden bunkers shielded by 10,000 pounds of reinforced concrete. And there's no secret about what they're for. Uh, planning for these uh, massive ordnance penetrators, as they're called, began in the Bush years, but languished until Obama came into office and uh, rapidly called for develop, accelerating the development, which is now happening. They've been accelerated by several years and are supposedly coming into the arsenal very soon. Uh, well, these comments uh, barely scratch the surface of the formation and implementation of policy during the unipolar moment, but I think they're characteristic. Uh, one significant element is the continuity of planning and, interp and, and interpretation since World War II, uh, when the United States shouldered the responsibility that was eloquently described by Winston Churchill, the responsibility to protect the interests of the satisfied nations whose power places us above the rest, the rich men dwelling in peace within their habitations to whom the government of the world must be entrusted, uh, now under Washington's guiding hand. And that remains the uh, operative meaning of the fashionable praise responsibility to protect. 